Well, welcome back, everyone, from, I hope, uh, what was a, a tasty lunch and a nice uh, break from our discussions. We'll return uh, to a theme of managing common spaces, and we have three very distinguished um, speakers on this theme uh, for the next hour and 15 minutes. So I'll begin by first turning over the floor to Alexei Beryukov, who is a senior advisor uh, for the Center for International Information Security and Science and Technology Policy at MGIMO University. Thank you for the introduction. Well, I'll start with general questions and then I'll go into details. In the context of convergence of the virtual and real space, we see the emergence of new fields where the state acts jointly. And in these contexts, we see the problem of the right understanding of the global priority. I'd like to pay your attention to this global priority. Various states understand global priority in a different way. That is why very often the national is seen as something of the global interest. And around this, we have a lot of state conflicts and controversies when the such kind of substitute leads to the wrong vision of priorities. Another important factor that influences the um, management of common spaces is the concept of the equal game field in the um, political and economic as well as technology tracks. These trying to do it on the equal footing happens despite the fact that there are different laws of development. This happens for Russia too. In Russia, we have scholars, Simon Opek and Mrazo Sergei, who describe the concept of the advanced development that has been tested in practice. It's based on high technologies and education, and it gives really good results prominent results. This is a difficult space, and we are going to receive many comments on this, maybe during this session too, and that's true, no doubt. Another problem that has to do with it is the um, issue of openness. It is absolutely necessary for a development and many countries state that it is necessary to make openness of a greater quality. It's not about being frightened of a fly that enters the, wind, the room when the window is open. The political interdependence and its growth, the um, sources of knowledge, competences, and experience also comes from abroad. That is why the task is not to exacerbate the issue of interdependence, but to solve the um, issue of strengthening national, scientific, industrial, and educational potential. This is the problem that is to be solved by the country through international cooperation to become part of the global technology transfer and other global revolutionary processes that take place on the planet, we need to be ready for them. These procedures are of interdependent and simultaneous nature, and to get the profit that you account on, you need to be ready to participate in this global process. Not to be too theoretical, I'll get to the practice and examples. For example, the sanctions of the U.S. that have been expanded, the sanctions against Russia in the technology fields in the first place, strangely did not affect the nuclear energy where our country for many decades has been a leader and has actively learned to get profit from this leadership. As soon as you lose on the technology field your position, the sanctions become an instrument to strengthen this and to oust this kind of country from this field. So the best remedy 
to cure sanctions is the technological power and leadership, or at least a serious alternative to the existing developments. The USA used to be quite strong at this. Now, China is also getting strength. For example, it creates a core of 180 million intelligent and educated people, and by 2020 they would complete this task, and it is quite concerning. Moreover, the rate of getting intellectual property rights the rate and the, the, well, the first place belo belongs to China in the global ranking of intellectual property rights. When the International Space Station was established, remember this joint project with Americans, different technology solutions to the same problems were not an obstacle to introduce limits to the technology advancement. Well, it hasn't been confirmed, by the way, and nevertheless, when the lunar or moon module was established at the initiative of the US, various technology solutions were an obstacle that couldn't be um, solved. And thus Russia became just a learner at this global space project at the um, space orbit. The country that has launched the first cosmonaut into space agreed to the status of someone who is learning, and that instead of breakthrough projects in the space. As a result, these circumstances, the lack of confidence that doesn't allow us to um, establish joint cooperation in the space, all these is an obstacle. Another example from the f management of common spaces. Here I'm talking about the meeting of experts in Geneva in the field of cyberspace, when a couple of hours before the meeting, the American delegation didn't arrive, despite the fact that presidents agreed on their arrival and on this meeting. And the presidents discussed this, which means that they give the priority to these issues, because cybersecurity is equal to nuclear security. So imagine that cybersecurity is getting close to the um, weapons of mass destruction according to its effect and importance. As a result of the fact that the American delegation didn't arrive at Geneva talks, we couldn't agree on the most important issues that were mentioned during the last session. These were the issues of the um, legislation, soft power, all this has not been coordinated by these experts. So these documents were not legally obligatory and binding, unfortunately. Despite the fact that they are very important. Yesterday, together with the, some of the Americans, we discussed the cooperation in the field of cybersecurity, various sci projects, and how cybersecurity affects citizens. And in our political science literature, we also discuss the quadrature of Internet, which means that on the first stage of functioning of the Internet, the network status of a participant of the um, virtual reality participate calls for um, transparency, informational security, anonymity. And what do we have as a result? This has been transformed into what's on the contrary. So all the rules have been violated. None of them are complied with. And even the essence of communication in the, on the Internet has been changed completely. 
And another important issue, the digital economy is on the growth. And at the same time, we do not pay enough attention to security of the um, digitalization. But this is both sides of one kind. And this is very important. And the understanding of the fact that these sides of the same coin have to be developed simultaneously and in an intense way. But we understood this not only, not only here, but this was also discussed at the World Economic Forum. And the such issues of security development on the Internet are of a great interest, not only for uh, the state, but also for businesses and the society at large. And the last thing, I, as I understand, I'm running out of time. There's no vacuum in international relations. Well, the relations between Russia and U.S. are now not in the vacuum. They are still developing. What I see now is the um, intensification of the, um, for example, in the space Recently, there's been a delegation in Moscow and in the city of Kazan where we had intense talks on cybersecurity. So this vacuum is always filled with a productive content and, and very important negotiations. But if we detach ourselves from all these high-tech issues, well, look at the north of Russia. It is also a common space. It's affected by the influence of China. For example, China also uses the northern sea route to export goods that costs about 700 million US dollars. That is why they are building the infrastructure. And the north of Russia, the um, northern Eurasian position, geographic, geographical position of Russia is very important. There are a lot of uh, boreal forests, the permanent um, frost, permafrost. A large chunk of the Russian territory is in the conditions of permafrost, and all these influences the climate across the world. Thank you. Here is Professor Paul Berkman, uh, a professor at, of science diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Professor Berkman. Thank you, Chris. Um, as director of the Carnegie Corporation, project uh, contributing support for this conference. I thank MGMO uh, for your ongoing collaboration to build common interests among nations, in particular between the United States and Russian Federation. I also thank Andrei Baikov, along with Dan Dresner, Chris Miller, Arik Borkovsky, and other collaborators for convening the second conference here in Moscow. For me, this shared journey with MGMO began in 2007, and in particular, I thank Professor Alexander Vilikjanin, for continuously sharing his insights about international law with balance, precision, and interest in stability among nations. Importantly, I thank Alexander for his friendship and trust, appreciating the many contributions that we have developed together. My hope from this conference is others from MGIMO and the Fletcher School also will come to enjoy highly productive relations over the coming years. Briefly for background, in 2010, while I was at the University of Cambridge, Alexander and I co-directed the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia regarding security in the Arctic Ocean. This dialogue brought together senior diplomats and experts from 17 nations with involvement of four Russian ministries and representation to the President of the Russian Federation through Arthur Chilingarov. Clearly, NATO and Russia are like oil and water underscoring the Russian military doctrine that identifies NATO as a main external military danger. Yet the two of us, 
professors in academic institutions were able to accomplish something that no government or organization could achieve. The lesson here is that academic institutions have powerful positions in our global society to convene dialogues among allies and adversaries alike without the agendas of governments, businesses, or non-governmental organizations in a matter that promotes cooperation and prevents conflict, two sides of the coin of peace. Along these lines, both MGIMO and the Fletcher School are premier institutions for training the next generation of diplomats who enter the foreign ministries in the Russian, foreign, Russian Federation and the United States, respectively. With this perspective, Alexander and I began teaching a course on science diplomacy, environmental security, and law in the Arctic Ocean, which this year became the first obligatory course that MGIMO has offered with a foreign institution. The journey that Alexander and I have been on reflects science diplomacy as an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process involving informed decision-making to balance national interests and common interests for the benefit of all on Earth across generations, recognizing that nations will always first and foremost look after their national interests. To more fully illustrate the implications and applications of science diplomacy, a year ago, in May 2017, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov came to the United States and was introduced to the American public from pictures taken in the Oval Office with President Donald Trump. This visit by Foreign Minister Lavrov was timed with a meeting that he was going to the following day in Fairbanks, Alaska, where he was to meet with then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, along with foreign ministers of other Arctic states, to sign the agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation, recognizing first the importance of maintaining peace, stability, and constructive cooperation in the Arctic. This Arctic science agreement entered into force yesterday. In signing this agreement, the Arctic states once again have demonstrated their responsibility for the sustainable development of the Arctic and their firm resolution to achieve this goal by promoting regional cooperation based on best available knowledge, uh, according to Vladimir Barbin, the senior Arctic official for the Russian Federation who co-chaired the task force for this agreement. Russia and the United States also chaired task forces through the Arctic Council that led to binding agreements for search and rescue, as well as marine oil pollution prevention preparedness and response, signed by the foreign ministers of the Arctic states in 2011 and 2013, respectively. The Arctic Council itself, as the high-level forum that was established among the eight Arctic states in 1996, is a poignant example of the central role of science to foster productive relations among nations, even when they have significant geopolitical differences elsewhere on the Earth. Origin of the Arctic Council goes back to the Cold War and the famous Murmansk speech by Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987 when he introduced the concept of an Arctic Research Council and the vision for the North Pole to be a pole of peace. These lessons of science diplomacy in the Arctic go back to the decades immediately following World War II, when the United States and Soviet Union in particular began to establish areas beyond national jurisdiction under international law, reducing the capacity for nations to assert and defend boundaries in view of their national interests on a global scale. By establishing international spaces, starting with the high seas in 1958, Antarctica in 1959, outer space in 1967, and the deep sea in 1971, the community of nations on Earth was effectively reducing the potential exercise of jurisdiction that triggered global conflict. Throughout the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Union cooperated in Antarctica and outer space. What are the lessons from these regions that have enabled the United States and Russia, then and now, to cooperate despite their acrimony and distrust elsewhere in the world. As recognized in the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in Washington, D.C. on December 1, 1959, at the height of the Cold War, involving 60 secret meetings in the United States convened by President Eisenhower beforehand, despite the reign of fear during the McCarthy era in the United States, the lessons are clearly articulated in the preamble of the Antarctic Treaty 
recognizing that it is in the interest of all mankind that Antarctica shall become f forever be used for exclusively for peaceful purposes and shall not become the scene or object of international discord. Convinced that the establishment of a firm foundation on the basis of freedom of scientific interests <laughs> accords with the interests of science and the progress of all mankind. The starting point for the Antarctic Treaty, as well as the other international spaces, is common interests, in contrast to differences among nations which are far easier to identify. Science is a powerful tool of diplomacy because it builds common interests, facilitating inclusion despite the fact that nations are inherently exclusive in their operation. Promoting cooperation and preventing conflict, it is also important to note that the Antarctic Treaty is the first nuclear arms agreement in our globally interconnected civilization. We live in an increasingly complex world, where the global population of humans has more than doubled since World War II, reaching nearly 8 billion people by the end of this decade. In addition to the global consequences of nuclear technologies, Global transformations are accelerating from science, technology, and innovation, more generally from robotics and artificial intelligence to genetically modified organisms and the Internet. In this brave new world, training of next generation diplomats will require science diplomacy to utilize the powerful advances as well as respond to the dangerous risks from the new dependencies introduced by science, technology, and innovation. In this arena of innovation, with their expertise and direct relationship to foreign ministries in the Russian Federation and the United States, IMGIMO and the Fletcher School have opportunities to provide leadership triangulated with education and research. The APEX goal for all of us, especially our leaders, is informed decision making. But what is an informed decision? How can we tell when decisions are uninformed? With lessons from the areas beyond national jurisdiction designated under international law, informed decisions can be seen to operate across a continuum of urgencies in every case, with longer time spans involved at larger spatial scales. At the scale of the Earth and our globally interconnected civilization, the urgencies extend from security time scales, mitigating the risks of political, economic, and cultural instabilities that are immediate to sustainability timescales, balancing economic prosperity, environmental protection, and societal well-being across generations. Most importantly, how do we achieve informed decision-making? Answer to this question involves science diplomacy, starting with questions to build common interests, like this conference. From the questions of common concern, come methods of science considered broadly as a study of change to include the natural sciences and social sciences as well as indigenous knowledge, all of which generate data revealing patterns and trends that become the basis for decisions. However, data are not evidence, revealing which emerges in the context of government's governance mechanisms. Evidence itself only compels decision makers to act without revealing what, when, where, or how. These implementation features are revealed in terms of options without advocacy, which can be used or ignored explicitly, simply contributing to informed decisions. It is options where the diplomacy arises with inclusion in contrast to recommendations with advocacy that engender political reactions. Our responsibility here is to contribute to informed decision making by governments, which establish the government governance mechanisms but also by businesses that are involved with technology and financing of built infrastructure. It is the coupling of governance mechanisms and built infrastructure that contribute to sustainable solutions. This conference is a success merely because it is happening at this time of renewed animosity between the United States and Russia, bringing principal academic institutions involved with ministries of foreign affairs at these, of these two great nations. Building on common interests expressed here today is a step toward promoting cooperation and preventing conflict for the benefit of all on earth, thinking with vision and hope across generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Berkman. And our third speaker is uh, Professor Alexander Vilijanin, who is the chair of the Department of International Law at MGMO University. 
in fact, uh, the, our intellectual collaboration with Professor Bergman started early, as you have heard, and we were wise enough not to concentrate on some objects which are really, as we could see from the previous session, a sort of uh, uh, object of different opinions. We were wise enough to concentrate on what might stimulate collaboration between two nations. For young generations who are present here at our conference, I might remind once again that United States and Russia were allies during lots of world wars. First, Russia was an ally of the United States when the United States was uh, struggling for its independence against Great Britain, forgive me, Tim, just it was a part of history, the war between Great Britain and the United States. And Russia was with the United States. Second, Russia was the ally of the United States during World War I. And the most important ally was during the World War II, when the United States and Russia at that time within the Soviet Union not only were allies during the war against Nazi uh, troops, they created modern international law. Probably not all people know that it is during the meetings between the heads of state of the Soviet Union, of United States of America and Great Britain, that the major key components of the United Nations Charter were agreed upon. And that is very important for today's interpretation of what exactly the United Nations Charter as the major source of the contemporary international law provides. And we are proud of, it, of that, and our idea is, of course, to, uh, to bring this responsibility of creating modern international law to future generation of diplomats, of law researchers, and so on, and to people, of course. Uh, speaking about common spaces, we usually say about those spaces which are beyond national jurisdiction. We speak about high seas, for instance, both in Pacific Ocean, both in Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, and of course in the Arctic Ocean. We speak about outer space, and it's uh, a huge object of collaboration between the United States and at that period of time of the Soviet Union, when the first international treaties, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and the Mund Agreement of 1979 were agreed upon, these are universal international treaties. But they were created by United States and the Soviet Union, practically. The only two space powers at that period of time. Not today, of course. There are lots of space powers today. Uh, also, we might uh, say that, uh, uh, as Professor Berkman already mentioned, yes, there are lots of new international agreements in the Arctic which, which are created with the consent of United States and the Russian Federation. And uh, I would say that today the challenge is uh, to find a proper balance, legal balance. On the one hand, stability of the legal regime of the Arctic Ocean, the high seas, uh, which was established long, long ago, the convention between the Great Britain and Russian Federation of 1825, which provided the first clauses on the legal regime of polar possessions of Great Britain at that period of time and Russian Empire, the sector meridian boundaries, and also the convention between the United States 
and Russia of 1867 also providing legal regime for polar possessions and these meridian lines. These two conventions today, strange as it may seem, they protect national interests of the United States. Otherwise, there are no other legal basis for protecting, for instance, United States uh, rights on the Arctic continental shelf beyond 200 miles exclusive economic zone. So I believe that we are supposed to find this delicate balance and to conserve this balance. And of course, it's researches from United States and Russian Federation who are supposed to, to lead this very important intellectual activity. Uh, today, as you probably know, the agreement on prevention of unregulating fishing in the Arctic high seas area again was initiated by the United States, but it was supported strongly by uh, Russian Federation, and the text of this agreement, the draft of this agreement, was created by the two teams, and uh, probably you know that the text is... Uh, uh, at, the, at this period of time is uh, polishing, is being polished, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, we presume that it, uh, if we are lucky, probably it might be signed in the near future, this year already. And this important agreement, I believe, provides a very good balance when Arctic, like United States and Russia, and non-Arctic states, like Japan, China, and other countries are participating together to address this very important issue because uh, the huge area, the largest enclave of the high seas in the world, the square miles 2.8 square million kilometers, huge area, and that huge area is an object of very specific legal regulation. And of course, again, uh, this is an advantage for United States and Russia to cooperate, to be leaders in this very important issue. I'll be glad to answer other questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you to all three of our speakers. We have about a half an hour for questions. I'll start right there, please. Uh, so I would sit if you don't mind. Uh, my question concerns the cyber domain. I actually wanted to ask it during the previous session, but I just didn't get the opportunity. So, at, um, well, first, we need to recognize that, to the best of my knowledge, there has been no, um, no there have been no uh, law, international law tools to regulate the cyber domain. We don't even have a common definition of what is a cyber attack. We don't have any um, instrument of legal sanctions to prosecute those who actually commit this cyber attack. And so uh, this is, again, the problem of attribution and many, many other problems that appear here for the United States and Russia as global players in the cyber domain. Since we, finished, uh, since we finished working within the Mgimo Fletcher team upon the nuclear cyber disentanglement or entanglement, as one prefers uh, to call it, um, I've been going back and forth on one single question. Uh, do you see, and here I address the question to any of the distinguished professors, uh, do you see any potential for um, a cyber attack? Esca for a cyber attack escalating into a nuclear scenario, be it the United States and Russia or any other countries. Because since our relations are really heated nowadays and the cyber domain is, highly, is hardly predictable uh, and is totally unregulated, uh, this scenario is possible. So do you see any possibility for this? Thank you. This session is intended to think in terms of common interests. So with the invention of the Internet, uh, we created a set of dependencies that didn't exist before, international banking systems, uh, personal security in terms of communications, etc. cetera. Um, your first question, part of your question, related to the notion of sanctions and attacks. And 
and nuclear scenarios. Um, I think we have to step back and think in terms of perspective. Um, we are talking largely in this discussion today about things that are happening at a political time scale. Um, you can imagine that your children, when you have children, if you don't have them already, will be alive in the 22nd century. And that the, the urgencies that they will face aren't going to just happen instantaneously. They're going to start with the world that we live in today. And so, in a sense, the, the challenge that you're asking about is a moving target. And so, how do we respond to that moving target? And it isn't a, it isn't a simple cyber security issue. It's the, it's the larger issue of science and technology innovations that are happening regularly with accelerating transformation on a planetary scale. And I would go back to something that, that, that Joel Trackman said earlier. The unity of, the, of these legal solutions, in effect, involves the tribunals that are established by the international community, recognizing that there are different interpretations that uh, nations will have. And this is the prerogative of nations. They're sovereign entities to come up with different interpretations. So the, the solutions, in a sense, are going to emerge because there are differences, but these solutions are not going to emerge in view of those differences. They're going to emerge in view of the common interests. And those are the starting points. And I would say, you know, there's, as a, just as an observation, there's a whole field called conflict resolution. And Diana Chigas talked about this earlier. There's no field called common interest building. They both have the same objective. I think the difference is the orientation. And it is much easier for nations to identify their differences than their similarities. And you know, presumably the opportunity that exists in this conference, where we have two premier institutions training next generation diplomats, is to think in terms of common interests and to build collaborations like the ones that Professor Villajan and I have been fortunate to have over the last decade. To think in terms of ways that are forward looking, not just reactive in terms of political timescales. So, that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. I would like to add a few comments. Unfortunately, uh, talking of cyberspace, um, assessments and uh, forecasts here are not optimistic. Many experts believe that this is a, a chaos uh, zone, that legally and politically cyberspace uh, is uh, essentially a, a, you know, a, a wild, uh, it's not regulated, it's, cha it's chaotic. Um, for one thing, there are constantly cyber attacks. Uh, tens of uh, millions of cyber attacks a year, annually. Uh, and um, uh, those are not, you know, necessarily Russian or American hackers. It's just, you know, people online. It's just some personalities who do that. Um, and uh, theoretically, yes, they can lead to some kind of a military scenario or some kind of a extreme scenario, uh, potentially. So I am not optimistic. I'm rather pessimistic. And I believe that we need some very strict, rigid solutions that would prevent the very possibility of a negative, you know, spill out from, from these cyber attacks. Uh, I am anything but a computer technology specialist. I'm anything but an expert in IT. And uh, to be honest with you, I would not even be able to uh, do some of the uh, operations I do on the computer for this institute, for, the, for this university, if not for uh, help and support from my son. Um, I liked, uh, uh, I, I will have to argue uh, with my colleague, with my fellow Russian, uh, Russian uh, scholar, uh, I don't uh, uh, really sub su subscribe to this notion of uh, cyberspace being legally chaotic or being this, this kind of chaos zone. Um, I believe that legal nihilism is always bad, and believing that some area cannot be regulated or cannot be put in 
different uh, legal uh, fr uh, you know framework uh, legal boundaries is just wrong um, uh, just recently we had a German professor uh, professor Lotterman L Lotterman who was uh, a legal expert and he actually described to us a rather comprehensive um, wide-reaching legal basis legal framework in the EU in Germany and uh, even in the United States for for regulating you know computer um, IT the the IT market and so that this tells us that there isn't really no chaos uh, in the area of uh, IT or, or cyberspace it is controllable but of course if we're, if we're talking about an international market uh, of course uh, there is an issue and uh, we could cite some of the experts who have been publishing uh, on the on this issue, you know, for more, some more profound reading on the issue. Thank you, Professor Biryukov. Um, picking up on what the Secretary General of the United Nations said at the Munich Security Conference earlier this year, that in light of the failure of the governmental group of experts last year in their fifth session to agree on a report. And in light of the um, uh, opposition, particularly from Western countries, to the adoption of the Shanghai Cooperation Drafted Code of Conduct on Information Security, would the professor agree with uh, the UN Secretary General that it is an important moment for the United Nations to take forward um, mechanisms under international law in the field of international information security and or uh, cyber security. Would you like to respond to his remarks from the Munich Security Conference? Well, certainly, I can only agree with the Secretary General. Uh, but uh, it is a separate uh, matter that the failure of this group of actors, uh, experts does not mean that, that this very institution, this very forum should be abandoned. No, it will continue to work and evolve. I believe it will remain a central element of this system of, of, of providing uh, international uh, information security. How it will work remains to be seen. It is still being discussed uh, and uh, agreed upon right now. As for the uh, Shanghai Code of Conduct uh, draft, uh, the, 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 the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's draft Code of Conduct, um, I believe that at least for now there are no other positive initiatives in this space, in this in this uh, market. It is uh, a helpful initiative that could uh, lay uh, the foundation for cooperation in the future. Thank you very much for your remarks. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the alternative approaches um, uh, to the governance of uh, common space in the Arctic space, in Arctic. Uh, you have cited several treaties that, has been, uh, that have been concluded during the last decades between the United States and uh, uh, Russia. But as we see that uh, these countries uh, now are facing certain difficulties or experiencing certain difficulties in, in such a high-level dialogue, uh, and uh, I would like to ask you, um, your opinion, um, could you elaborate a little bit on whether these states could collaborate? So I mean that these regions, like the, those who are bordering the Arctic uh, region, like in Russia, the Murmansk region and so on, could they uh, make some cooperation or some agreements with United States states? So not just on the federal level, but is it possible to uh, create some projects of innovation, technology exchanges, just on not the federal level, but on other level. So I would like to ask you to elaborate on these alternative channels of cooperation. Thank you very much. You are me? Okay. Uh, well, I think that, yes, there is such a possibility, 
And in fact, the practice of international law provides uh, for lots of examples when parts of states, whether subjects of federation, are involved in international agreements, or specifically there are agreements between parts of states. Uh, just to take into account the provisions of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969, according to this universal treaty, such agreement, agreements between subjects of federation, between parts of uh, some states, are not international treaties. Uh, so, on the one hand, of course, we are encouraging cooperation between regions, and I believe that that is a very useful thing, especially in the Arctic, where we have lots of specific problems, environmental, uh, relating to, uh, to uh, local populations, especially uh, the indigenous people, and so on. On the other hand, we are we are to take into account that in order to improve the legal basis, the legal regime of the Arctic, the collaboration between Arctic states is a necessity. Uh, I think that United States and Russian Federation have really, even today, even uh, taken into account some rivalries, a competition, or even hostile uh, relations in other regions, still in the Arctic we have very good collaboration. For instance, in the area of the Bering Strait, you know that the, the, uh, uh, the Bering Strait is a very no narrow strait in the sense that there are big diamond islands and little diamond islands, and the distance between this big diamond island of Russia and Little Diamond Island of United States is around two miles, and a state boundary is coming between these two islands. We have very good collaboration, and one of the recent examples is a joint proposal on behalf of the United States and Russian Federation to the International Maritime Organization to improve traffic separation schemes and routing systems. And that is really very important. Take into account that the quantity of ships which pass through the Bering Strait and generally uh, the quantity of ships which participate in the Arctic shipping is really increasing with the uh, melting of ice and so on. So I believe that uh, Arctic is to be as my friend Paul says, isolated from other conflicts, from other problems between the United States and Russian Federation. It's really something which is supposed to be, I would say, treated as sui generis in Latin, a special, a special problem. And I believe today we have such possibilities. It isn't so much the Arctic or the Antarctic or outer space that themselves are important. It's the lessons that they offer to the world. So despite the fact that we had a Cold War, the United States and Russia, Soviet Union, cooperated in outer space and Antarctica. Despite the fact that we have animosity today between the United States and Russian Federation, clearly evident in everything we read in the newspapers, the United States and, and Russia are cooperating in the Arctic. So the question is why? What are the lessons that exist in those regions that enable these two great nations to cooperate despite the animosity that exists elsewhere in the world? The simple answer is that it, they use science as a tool of diplomacy. Your question also related to the notion of regions, so states uh, versus regions. And I would argue that the solutions to the Arctic as a region, as a part of the planet, are not going to be necessarily only at the state level. 
So regions like Arkhangelsk or Murmansk or Quebec, Ontario, Alaska, Chukotka, around the Arctic have a significant role in terms of actually achieving the sustainable development that is in, identified as a common Arctic issue among all of the Arctic states. And so we have as a world the notion of sustainable development goals. The idea of sustainable development goals being to 2030 in the agenda in a sense is an arbitrary point in time. But if you look at the concept of sustainability, sustainability operates across generations. And so the question is how do we create balance between economic prosperity, environmental protection, societal well-being within regions, within states, within subnational entities over time, over generations. And looking at the Arctic, the Antarctic and outer space affords us lessons as to how nations can cooperate despite the animosity that exists elsewhere. And so it isn't only a gloom and doom situation. And I would argue that the, that the starting point is effectively thinking in terms of common interests because it's certainly easy enough for all of these major actors to identify their differences. And as was identified earlier today in all of the discussions, it's very easy to identify the differences and positions. It's much harder starting point to think in terms of common interests. Yet these regions exist and have continued to thrive as regions of cooperation because the nations have continued to build on their common interests. I would also like to add a few comments. I fully agree with my colleague here, but I also would like to say that we must uh, discuss not only uh, uh, geographic issues, but we also need uh, a common uh, uh, a, a common sphere of uh, values. Uh, we need uh, a body of common thought. Um, so we need something binding us together mentally so that we would not need some, some kind of artificial, uh, you know, artificial uh, norms that, 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 that bind us together. Thank you. My name is Kozin. I am leading expert at the Center uh, for Military and Political Studies here at Gimo. Sorry for being late and jumped from the other conference. But I have uh, heard uh, some of your remarks. Well, first of all, I do not believe that the Cold War between us is over. Still goes on. Second. It's a very good notion to foster friendly, <coughs> proactive, positive relations between Washington and Moscow, no doubt. And I'm not going to blame the U.S. side for something, but just would like you to ask two figures in arms control. We still have 15.15 on resolved issues in arms control and disarmament. And we are still facing 12 negative attitudes of the United States to arms control agreements, either signed on bilateral basis or on multilateral basis. And I don't know where is the light in this deep tunnel. Unfortunately, no chances. Even summit that between Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump, which is in the air across the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean, I mean between us, is on the agenda, it cannot be arranged. So Mr. Ushakov stated clearly that your suggestion to arrange such a summit is on the table, but it says it is only on the table, dated March 20th. No arrangements have been made so far. Thank you. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of summits um, that are <coughs> potentially on the table, uh, in Arkhangelsk in uh, March of last year, uh, there were three presidents, uh, President of Russia Federation, President of Finland, and President of Iceland, um, that were participating in an international forum on the Arctic. And the President of Finland formally invited the three presidents and all of the other presidents to an Arctic summit. Now, the Arctic is an area of cooperation. Um, presumably, such a summit, whether it's convened under the chairmanship of, the fin of Finland when they have the Arctic Chair Council chairmanship or the Iceland subsequently, will happen between the Arctic states, including the United States and the, and the Russian Federation among the eight Arctic states. Um, in terms of light at the end of the tunnel, the dark tunnel that you speak of, and I always enjoyed Plato as well, um, if we think about it, the, the challenge that we face is not just getting through the moment. If we imagine that we have to prepare the world for the future, and we look at the situation that we're in with nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and other things that are of, of an extreme nature, World War II happened in the 20th century. The oldest calendars on Earth are 6,000 years old or thereabouts. That's 60 centuries. So one century out of 60 centuries is like one year out of a lifespan of 60 years. In a practical sense, our civilization, our globally interconnected civilization, the notion of a world war, our globally interconnected civilization is just in its infancy in terms of thinking about how to respond on a planetary scale to shared interests that operate across the Earth. And like infants, we bump into things, we make mistakes, and we cry about things. And that's the way the, the world is operating right now. And I think in terms of setting expectations correctly, we have to grow out of our infancy. And I would say two things about infants. One thing is the most vulnerable stage of a species' life. So there is great risk in terms of surviving beyond our infancy as a globally interconnected civilization. The other thing about infants, when you hold them in your arms, you can see the future. And infants have a great sense of hope. And so this is the dilemma that we face. We have to survive the moment to be able to grow into future stages as a globally interconnected civilization. And we're going to go crying and screaming and making mistakes along the way. And I think the value of these types of dialogues isn't so much that we as individuals come to agreement, but we have the opportunity to share the differences and the perspectives in an open and transparent manner with best of intentions to help mature as a civilization. So all of the things that are being introduced here are real. I mean, these are real problems that we have to solve. And we're just in our infancy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, just one uh, a small addition. Interesting enough that while Arctic states have not yet convened the Arctic summit, non-Arctic states have already had the Arctic summit. And Moscow Journal of International Law published, published a paper on the subject, on this subject, and uh, one of our uh, PhD students, Yelena Kienka, who was the author of this uh, paper, uh, you, you, re you see that I am referring to this Moscow Journal of International Law. Probably the dean of the uh, Tufts University might think that it's high time to subscribe to Moscow Journal of International Law, the oldest journal of international law, not under the Russian Federation, but in the former Soviet Union. Other questions? Uh, yes, my question will be addressed to Professor Berkman, and I would like to return to the topic of our discussion, the management of common spaces. And my question will be, con uh, will be connected with the cyberspace, because this notion was mentioned uh, here several times. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, do you regard uh, cyberspace uh, as a common space? omitting the fact that um, cyberspace is a very disputable legal notion. And secondly, if so, 
what are the um, common interests or maybe practical reasons uh, that uh, would incite uh, the United States at least to accept the idea of the uh, cre creation of the international organization uh, which would be responsible for uh, the, uh, for the internet governance. Thank you for your question. Um, one of the features that exists with the internet and cyberspace is the opportunity for asymmetric involvement. So it's not just nations that are involved. We could have a group of individuals that could take down a nation because they got involved with their security grid or because they compromised their banking systems. So I think there is a shared interest in being able to respond to those threats independent of any nation, to be able to respond to asymmetric threats. And again, it's a matter of looking for where the common interests are. Um, in terms of cyber as a, as a problem, I mean, we talk about the ability to creep into somebody's computer and to pull things out. With all of the information that's available and the tools for data analysis, the opportunities to integrate information themselves create new risks. I have patents in 20 countries involved with information technology, and I know that it's possible to take vast amounts of information and to identify patterns and trends that would be otherwise hidden from individuals because you can pull them together. And it's the danger there, the real danger, is like in, the, in your kitchen, where you've got something like Clorox and ammonia, which are completely innocuous compounds. But if you put them together, you get a poisonous gas. And the opportunity to go into the Internet and to pull information from disparate locations and put them together is a significant risk. And all of these risks exist in the world that we have today. And it's not just something that is fanciful, it's real. And it's something that all nations have a concern about. So I would answer your question in the sense of recognizing that there are common interests among the nations in terms of cyber. cyber. And, but it's, the, 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 there's a larger issue involved. With these technological developments, today it's the Internet, let's say it's some other solution that happens in the future, we create dependencies. So we become increasingly dependent on the use of the Internet our computers, our banking, etc. At the same time, with the dependencies, there's increased vulnerabilities. And the challenge is to be able to respond to those vulnerabilities together in a way that solves these problems. And again, you know, it's very easy to, to discuss this in terms of a contemporary, immediate political timescale. Risks of instability are all over the place at that time scale, filled with gloom and doom. I think the world would be a much healthier, more progressive oriented place if we recognize that many of the solutions that are involved are going to take decades and generations to figure out, and it's going to be iterative. There is no singular solution that's going to solve these problems. And so for the next generation, I would try and offer hope and inspiration. It's not the moment in terms of filled with gloom and doom and all of the problems that we currently see. Uh, Nikita, uh, there is one addition. Perhaps the focus on the establishment of an international organization concerning this question well, I think that it is counterproductive because when we are talking about an international organization, it always involves bureaucracy, red tape, financial contributions that are too large, and the contribution would have to be paid by the U.S., Russia, and other developed states. Just look at what happened with the um, international body on sea bottom because there one organization some countries pay for it and others use it and use it in a inefficient way so when we are talking about agreements within legal settlement and regulation of relations between states in such high-tech fields well it would be better and it would be writer to focus on bilateral agreements or regional agreements between the parties involved rather than 
focusing on the establishment of international bureaucratic organizations. I talked about uh, internet governance. Um, I well, uh, sorry for that. I, I was not very clear. In, uh, I mean um, the administration of, uh, of assigned names and numbers. Well, the top-level domains, generic or country top-level domains, it doesn't matter at all because today, uh, well, ICANN is not a very uh, efficient organization, first of all. Secondly, there are a lot of demands from the developing countries because they are poorly represented there and sometimes they do not have resources for that. And of course, thirdly, that um, well, the main concern of all states, not only uh, Russia, China, or m some European countries, is of course that in that organization, the role of governments is equal to the uh, to the role of uh, uh, ju um, uh, judicial persons, um, physical, um, or may uh, maybe um, individuals, etc. For example. Um, one of the cases connected with the Amazon generic domain, uh, and there is a debate between Brazil uh, and Peru from one side, and uh, from the Amazon company from, uh, from another side. And the main concern of the modern internet governance is that, well, uh, there is an internet uh, group of very powerful trans transnational co uh, companies such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. And they influence, in fact, uh, the decision making in that organization uh, and they govern uh, truly international objects, the internet. Uh, and th well, that's why I'm asked about um, what are the possible um, uh, common interests or maybe what are, the uh, what are the reasons for the sake of which the United States will cede uh, their position? Because when the ICANN was reformed the last time, uh, the main condition uh, of this reform was that the Internet governance wouldn't be uh, given to a, a truly inter intergovernmental organization. That it would be a judicial person created in the, in the national jurisdiction of the United States. That's uh, well, the substantive part of my question. I'll add something to your question. In 2007, we've seen that the Global Information Society was um, finished in, and the issue that they discussed is the internalization of the Internet. And they've discussed this issue for maybe 10 years before they had any conclusions. They wanted to go to the international electricity and communications union. Yes, it is a totally new experience. High-tech element of international relations leads to totally new elements. So this all is about pioneering. These are new paths to walk. That is why the international society, step by step, gradually paves the road. And the um, International T Telecommunication Union is taking the right steps to achieve progress. We, this is a, a pioneering period. Um, ICON, in terms of the names that are designated, an analogy would be countries that were effectively excluded from global communications um, because they weren't hardwired with landlines. And we developed a technology called cell phones. And suddenly, countries like China and India and, and across Africa and South America were speaking because there was a new technology. So I think the notion of pioneering is absolutely correct. These are incremental changes. As the problems are identified, it requires solutions. And it's iterative. It's, there is no singular mag magical bullet that's going to solve everything forever. The, the system, the problems, the challenges are completely dynamic. 
But you did raise a, another important point, and that, is, and that hasn't come up in this conference yet, and that is that with the introduction of multinational companies like Google, the arena of foreign affairs is completely changing. And so in the past, you would have had countries and the ministries of foreign affairs dealing with these international issues. Now you have multinational companies that have significant influence on the relation among nations. And I understand, uh, I think it was Facebook, I think Denmark is even talking about appointing an ambassador to Facebook. So the role of multinational companies, subnational entities, Quebec, California, whatever, is complicating the space, changing the space of international relations, because it's not only the prerogative of ministries to solve these problems. There, it's a complicated space. So the question you raise about, about uh, the names and, and the designations, it's part of a larger issue about the evolution that's happening in our world because of the introduction of all this science, technology, and innovation. Well, we're unfortunately out of time, so we won't be able to entertain any further questions, but I'd like to thank uh, my three panelists for a very interesting conversation. And please uh, stay seated, and we'll invite our next panel up here uh, right away. So thank you very much.